So this chapter that deals with gas power cycles is very long. Most of the material in it we skip. But the three things that you need to cover is the auto cycle, the diesel cycle, and the Brighton cycle. And all three of them use what they call air standard analysis. So today we need to cover the Brighton cycle. Remember the auto cycle? The Nicholas Otto, German engineer, basically these honored with a postage stamp. It was basically the gasoline internal combustion engine. We had to review what an internal combustion engine is, main group components of it. So a piston uh, reciprocating back and forth in a cylinder. That's basically what the auto cycle is trying to model, help us make some predictions of. And so what we end up generating are both PV and TS diagrams for what? The gas that's trapped in a piston cylinder apparatus, that's our system, and it's undergoing four processes. Is it an open system analysis or a closed system analysis that is the backbone of the auto cycle? We actually simplify the real engine and we just take and replace combustion with heat transfer, exhaust and intake with heat transfers, and now it's a closed system analysis. It's an approximation. It's what they call an abstraction, a great simplification of something that's very complex so that we can actually analyze it and make some predictions. So it's not open system analysis, closed system analysis, four processes. Then we studied the diesel cycle it's after this engineer, honored with a postage stamp, and you have a piston reciprocating back and forth. The auto, constant volume heat addition. The diesel, constant pressure heat addition. Very, very similar. Closed system analysis focusing on that trapped amount of pure air, that's the simplification, in the system. So you should be able to generate both TS and PV diagrams, because that's not on the equation sheet, is it? Recalling each of those four processes and analyze the system. Now we go to the Brayton cycle. There's a few of these that show up in the study of thermodynamics at this level. American engineer, believe it or not, cont contributed to the development of thermodynamics and is honored by his name attached to a cycle. Now. Like always, we honor somebody, we attach the name to the cycle, but the modern day implementation of that cycle looks very far from what he actually developed and put out on the market. But he was a mechanical engineer up in the Boston area, and he actually was producing little power plants that people could purchase. And uh, burn something to turn something, to burn something to lift something. And uh, we are still waiting to this day, I've not seen, the Brayton postage stamp, they honor everybody else, but uh, here it is, an American engineer still waiting for his day in the postage stamp business. Where do we see this cycle? Well, you see it in electric power generation where you're burning natural gas. The fuel source, methane, natural gas, you know, uh, uh, CH4s, methane primary component in natural gas. Right now, in the last few years, natural gas markets plummeted in price. It's, it's the glut of natural gas, right? A lot of people, are, if they're building any power plants, they're building natural gas power plants. For a while, they were thought about building some new nuclear plants. It didn't get killed because of regulation or kickback from environmentalists and all that opposition. It was killed because of the low price of natural gas. And uh, CPS Energy was going to invest in a, a, a high-end, almost research-like um, clean coal plant. They pulled the plug, said we don't want to invest in it anymore. Why? We got so much natural gas in the South Texas area and all over Texas. It's too cheap. It doesn't make economic sense anymore. Well, how do you make, how do you take natural gas and make electricity? The Brayton cycle. That's what you do. Uh, how many people drive I-10 ever go to, toward Houston? You ever go along and you can see on the side, right side of the road as you're going through Seguin, right after you pass the river there. What is that river? Uh, Guadalupe River? Maybe two miles, 
right there, there's a big um, couple plants, caterpillar plant and some other plants right there. But right there you could see um, combined cycle power plant owned by CPS. CPS just bought it about two years ago. And they burn natural gas as the primary fuel source. They put it through the Brayton cycle. In Thermal 2, you'll learn about the combined cycle where they combine the, this cycle, the Brayton cycle, also with the vapor power cycle, the traditional way. They don't, they used to years ago would burn natural gas like they burn coal to boil water. They don't do that. The, the, the gas turbines are so efficient that this is the way they generate electricity. So <clears throat> you'll see these, they pop up all over. They're very moduled, modular. They can get these built in a few years. How long would it take from start to finish to build a nuclear plant? Maybe 20 years. How about a coal-fired plant? Nobody's doing it anyway now. Very few people, they're running away from coal. Uh, and um, that would probably take twice as long. But a natural gas plant, you can build that real fast. They specialize in them. So you take the, the fuel and you bring in air into a compressor. All right. Then the compressor goes in. It's a higher pressure in the combustion chamber. And in the combustion chamber, you add your fuel. And the combustion gases are expanded through a gas turbine. They're still hot when they come out of the exhaust, but that's basically the end of the Brayton cycle. It's that simple. The gas turbine supplies enough mechanical power in a shaft. Sometimes it's in a gear set. Sometimes it's a direct drive. One solid shaft back to the compressor. And it also supplies ex excess mechanical power because the gas turbine produces more power than the compressor needs to run. Two, through a gear set to drive an electric generator to sell, make electricity and then sell it. That's the whole power plant. So we're going to study the Brayton cycle to make electricity. You can also understand the Brayton cycle is basically the way to understand propulsion systems. We don't have time. I was hoping to have more time under, to, to go through aircraft propulsion system. They're covered in Chapter 9, things like the turbojet, the turbofan, the turboprop, uh, afterburner on a turbojet. There's a lot of enhancements. What the shaft does, there's two major components. You have the compressor, you have the combustor, or the burner, combustor, and then the second major component is the turbine. Here, the goal is not to make a lot of electricity, not to provide a lot of shaft power out to somewhere in the basic simple turbojet engine, but to still have the exhaust gas, uh, gases at a high enough pressure to put them through, what does this look like? Something you studied, a nozzle, and to kick them out at very high speeds. Why would you want gases going out the back of your engine for a high speed at high speed? I'm looking for one word. Please give me this one word. What, what is the one word for a gas engine strapped on the bottom of a wing? Who's ever flown in an aircraft? You look out the window of the aircraft, you look at, there's a big old engine, a couple of them, right? Hanging off the bottom of the wing. That's what we're talking about. What, what is the aircraft engine doing on the bottom of that wing? What's its purpose? I'm looking, thrust. That's the word I'm looking for. And as a mechanical engineer, what's the key to give you high thrust? How would I estimate the thrust force that an engine would produce? It's the mass flow rate coming out the back. Bigger engine, more mass flowing through it, right? And the velocity. The forward thrust, basic out of dynamics. Go back in dynamics, right? <laughs> Look at it, really. It's don't leave mechanical engineering without knowing forward what makes up thrust. It's the mass flow rate times the velocity. That gives you the thrust. So that's what the nozzle's to do, to kick it out at a high exit speed. 
So from a linear momentum analysis, you get the forward thrust. Now, a lot of the engines on practical aircraft aren't just the turbojet. It's more efficient to actually supply a shaft out to drive a fan, which is in the front. The fan isn't an additional compressor. You still have the compressor section. You still have the burner and then the turbine. But what happens is it's better to take and throw this exhaust products out at slightly less because you had more energy extracted from it. But that energy drives a fan which in grabs more air. It's like a ring. Some of it goes into the middle, but a large part of it goes through and it bypasses. And to throw that out because you get more M dot, but slightly lower speed. It'll actually be quieter, too, and engines need to be quiet when you're landing and taking off near cities. Don't you agree? Have you ever lived near an airport? When I was in Austin, they used to have the air airport in downtown Austin. Uh, in about mid-90s or mid-80s, they moved it out to Bergstrom. Actually, now somebody told me the airport in Austin has more traffic than the airport in San Antonio. <laughs> more flights, <laughs> which is incredible. <laughs> But anyway, I never knew aircraft had headlights. You know aircraft have headlights? They sure did light up my bedroom. <laughs> and they had a city regulation. They couldn't land after midnight. You know what happened between 11.45 p.m. and 12 p.m.? One after another. Everyone lighting up my bedroom and uh, loud. <laughs> so I learned right away that noise is an issue. Anybody lived around aircraft and airports, they know that it can be an issue. But turbofans are much, much more common. If you're out there flying, you probably look out the window and that's a turbofan. Okay, well, let's move on because we don't have time to study this exciting stuff. Let's go back to the basics. Let's learn how they make electricity. So what they have is they ingest into a compressor air. They have a high pressure at state two. They add some fuel in the combustor. It all is now very high temperature, but the combustor doesn't change the pressure. The combustor is just to make it burn, and so it's much higher temperature. Oh, it's expanding as it goes through the combustor because of the high temperature, but it doesn't change pressure. It comes out at that high pressure because it's the same pressure as the inlet, and a lot of it, a lot of volumetric flow rate. And it passes through the turbine, which expands it, drops the pressure, and generates shaft power. That shaft power comes out of the turbine. Some of it goes back to drive the compressor. The excess is used to turn an electric generator and do something else with it. Okay. So this is the real deal. This then goes out the exhaust. Then you bring in fresh air, or intake air, and it goes through the system. This is too complicated for us, so what we want to do is simplify it. So we want to close the loop. And to close the loop, we'll put a heat exchanger in it that doesn't exist, but it closes the loop. That heat exchanger will dump heat to the environment, just like this hot exhaust gases is eventually cooled in the environment back down to the ambient air temperature in the environment. That's what we're basically modeling with that heat exchanger. This closes the loop. We get rid of the fuel. That's too complicated. Combustion products, it's changing CO2 and water vapor. No, we'll just leave it pure air. Isn't it the same type of analysis we did with the auto and a diesel? Sure. So the key idea is you have pure air and you have, it goes through the compressor what changes when you go through the compressor? The idea behind the compressor is to boost the pressure two greater than the pressure one. And often they specify a pressure ratio for the compressor. They'll give this as P2 over P1, which is called the pressure ratio. Here is where I'll make a lot of tongue twister mistakes you will make a lot of mistakes if you're not careful. We had a ratio for the auto cycle. We had a ratio for the diesel cycle. What was the name of that ratio? Compression ratio. 
and it was typically around 10 to 1 for auto cycle gasoline engines. It was around 20 to 1 for diesel cycle diesel engines. But that's a volume ratio. It started the volume at bottom dead and it went to top dead. That's the volume ratio. Now, for the Brayton, it's not. And I'll grade these exams no matter what I say. And somebody will treat the pressure ratio specified for the Brayton cycle as a volume ratio. Is the pressure ratio a volume ratio? No, it's a pressure ratio, okay? But it's easily confused because this word, that's the device doing the change in pressure, is a compressor. And it sounds like the compressor should be specified by a compression ratio. COM, COM, see? Compression ratio, compressor. That's the source, I think, of the confusion. But I'm telling you, in this textbook and all the textbooks that I've used in thermodynamics, they don't specify a volume change. They specify a pressure change. They specify the pressure ratio. Did I beat that one to death? Were you ready to move on 30 seconds ago? <laughs> Please don't make that mistake. I don't want to grade another exam where I have that mistake. Because once you make that mistake, it's really hard to get back on track. You're off. Gone. So we have a pressure ratio. Now this pressure at state 3 is the same as the pressure at state 2. What about the pressure at 4? What do you think about the pressure at 4? It's the same as the pressure at 1. Right away, you have a high pressure side and a low pressure side to this cycle. This is all the high. The combustor is at the high pressure. The intake to the compressor and the exhaust from the turbine is all low pressure. You only have two pressures, not four. How many independent, unique pressures do we have for auto and diesel? Four. So this one's a little simpler. Okay. Now, now that we have, uh, what I would do to analyze this system is you want to be able to go around and compute for each of these devices the work out or the heat in. This is a Q, uh, just call it heat exchanger, okay? So these are the, the two Qs of interest and the two Ws of interest that we need to calculate in order to get maybe the power out or the thermal efficiency, the back work ratio, those metrics for the cycle. How are we going to calculate, let's do the easy one, the work out of the turbine? How are you going to calculate the work out of the turbine? What's a general equation to calculate the work out of the turbine? Haven't we analyzed turbines enough? So you would do this. What did I just do around that turbine? I put a control volume. I'm going to, I'm going to analyze. I'm going to do a first and second law analysis around that turbine. For, do a control volume analysis. Is that an open system analysis or a closed system analysis that I'm about ready to do around this turbine? Open or closed? Open. It's open. Why is it open? Mass is coming in and mass is going out. When you did the process analysis for auto and diesel, those were processes from state one to state two during the compression or expansion. Those are processes. That's not open system, it's closed system. So right away, you do the first law analysis, and this is uh, W dot divided by M dot, that's what I'm wanting to calculate, lowercase work per unit mass out of the turbine. It'll boil down to H3 minus H4. I know there's a few steps I'm trying to say. We've been in this class for many weeks. We've analyzed turbines. Doesn't that equation look reasonable? What can you tell me about the turbine if I write that it's equal to H3 minus H4? What about the heat transfer? It's adiabatic. What about the change in kinetic energy? Negligible. How about the change in elevation and potential energy? Negligible. And what about, is it transient or steady state? It's steady state. It's our standard assumptions to simplify. Oh, you can throw and make it a harder problem for the poor students. But let's get the basics down before we complicate the analysis of a turbine. All right. How about for the compressor? Now, this is the work into the compressor, 
I want to talk about a positive work in, or if you want, go this way, put WC out, and you know you're going to have a negative work whichever way you want to go. If we do a negative work, it's going to be the H1 minus H2. Which H is greater? Which enthalpy is greater? Is H1 greater than H2? Or is H1 less than H2? H1 is less than H2. That's very good. See how much you learned? Enthalpy is a measure of not only the internal energy, but also the flow energy, the PV term. Okay, so as I've shown it, H1 minus H2 will be a negative work. True? Okay, let's do the heat transfer in the compre not compressor, in the combustor. What is that equal to? What's the QC, which is Q dot divided by M dot? Control volume around the combustor, what's it going to boil down to? Any shaft work? No. no. It's just the heat transfer from an external heat source into the working fluid. That's how we model this combustion. H3 minus H2. Exactly. And how about the heat transfer? Let's turn this one around and put it into the heat exchanger, knowing that that's now going to be negative. Is that going to be H1 minus H4? Don't want a negative sign in any of this. Is that true? Okay. So you see that to calculate something like the thermal efficiency of the cycle, what is it's going to be a ratio of the net work, which is work turbine. Now I'm going to put plus the work of the compressor, knowing that's negative, as we've written it. And you're going to divide it by how much heat is coming into the cycle that's only coming in in the combustor. So we could calculate the thermal efficiency of this cycle. So does we calculate the works and the Qs for each component. How about the back work ratio? That's a metric very similar to the vapor power cycle. It's how much of the turbine output has to go back to feed the compressor. I might well get rid of that negative sign. That's the back work ratio, isn't it? That could be 30, 40, that could be 50%. That's a lot of power. What was the back work ratio of the typical uh, Rankine cycle? 1%. Brayton, really high. In the history books, what do you think they had working as engineers? Did they have gas turbines working before steam engines and steam turbines and steam power plants? Or did they have steam before gas turbines? When was the first gas turbines really brought to bear in the history? The end of World War II. Messerschmitt, I forget the number. Anybody in aviation buff? The Germans were developing that heavily, and they got it to fly. And they, it was a great aircraft and shot down a lot of opponents, but it was too late <laughs> to, to have an impact in the war. At the Messerschmitt, what? Two something, yeah, two six something, two six two. You can look it up if you have your phone real fast. The Messerschmitt, but anyway, the. Uh, um, um, the, the U.S. knew what they were doing, and we were right behind them. <laughs> and I think we actually fielded, the United States fielded maybe uh, experimental jet engines at the end of the war. But other than that, all those aircraft, uh, how did they work? Piston cylinder. Piston cylinder. Okay. And the thrust that you can get out of a jet engine is incredible. <laughs> so in a dogfight, uh, the piston cylinder propeller, not, not as good. Okay, but the back work ratio is much, much higher. That's the key parameter, which I would say simply explain why it's so much harder to build one of these and get it to work. Because you could build a power plant with a really like only 40% or 30% efficient steam turbine. It could still work. It would still run. You can't get a 30, 40 percent efficient turbine, gas turbine, and make this work. This has to be up in the, you know, 
usually in the 90 percentage range for isentropic efficiency. Same with the compressor. And when they start to go south a little bit, the thing won't work. It, you have to have a really good design for a compressor and a really good design for a, a turbine, and that'll work. Okay, So it's a lot more detailed and uh, careful manufacturing and engineering in the device. All right, so the key is to, make a, to get all the states. I would make a table to get the states. right? And that state 1, you have state 2, you have state 3, you have state 4, and maybe the pressure, the temperature, Enthalpy, entropy, those are the key players. And um, let's talk about this. Typically, P1, you come in with a pressure, you come in with the temperature, and then you can look up the enthalpy and entropy. If I have an ideal Brayton cycle, what is it saying about that compressor? What is its isentropic efficiency of the compressor? It's 100%. So if it's 100% isentropic efficiency, you've analyzed compressors. They're in Chapter 6. What's S2 compared to S1? The same, from the second law. So basically, the pressure ratio specifies P2. The second law specifies S2. Those two properties help fix the state, P and S. Hence, you can get H and T. Now you go, what about the pressure at 3? That's equal to pressure at 2. Typically, they specify the temperature coming out of the combustor. That's often given, just like you're given pressure 1 and temperature 1. So this P and T fix that state. The P and T will fix state 3. You can get the enthalpy and the entropy. Then what do you do to get to state 4? Well, it's going through a turbine. If it's an ideal, the best you can do turbine for the Brayton cycle, what's the efficiency, isentropic efficiency of the turbine? 100%. And so S4 is equal to S3, just like going from 1 to 2, 3 to 4. 4 is fixed by the pressure and the entropy. So P4 is equal to P1. There you go, and then you get that enthalpy. That's how you get these enthalpies. I make it look easy, don't I? You ready to jump in? Review, what is quickly, we're only going to do air standard analysis for the Brayton, just like the diesel and the auto cycle. So just, if, if you missed last time, it's a lot to remember, but we're just doing air only and it's an ideal gas, etc. <coughs> Let's solve this problem. Air standard ideal Brayton cycle operates with 90 kilopascal and 300 Kelvin at the compressor inlet. This is the type of problem you get on exam. What I encourage you to do is, from memory, sketch the components and the states between the components. You're going to have a compressor. Is that too hard to remember? No. Burner or combustor, whatever you want to call it a turbine, and then another heat exchanger. You can draw them other than black boxes, but I would just put boxes for the simplicity of it all. And we know that the air flows in a cycle, and we might as well put state one, inlet to the compressor, state two, outlet, state three, and state four. And then what I would also do is, you know your major work components, and uh, I probably should have sketched this on our property diagrams. The, the most useful is a temperature entropy diagram for this cycle. Let's do it for a, on a temperature entropy diagram. Okay, so going from state one to state two, they tell us the, the compressor pressure ratio is given, and it's adiabatic, reversible, hence it's isentropic. So you're going to increase the temperature, state 1 to state 2. It'll be a straight line on a TS diagram. Then going through the burner, you're adding heat. Bringing with the heat is the entropy, but it's happening along a line of constant pressure. This is what a line of constant pressure looks like on a TS diagram up to state 3. 
the temperature comes out really hot out of the burner. Then four, three to four, it's isentropic expansion through the turbine. And then heat loss, rejection in that other heat exchanger. There it is. That's our cycle on a TS diagram. Okay. We then probably want to introduce, um, we, I mean, I can rewrite these uh, Qs, like the Q in the burner is equal to H3 minus H2. We've got to get the Hs. Uh, the work into the turbine is H3. Um, uh, uh, I'm sorry, it's not into the turbine, is it? Out of the turbine. H3 minus H4. And then we're going to draw it the funny way. I'm going to draw it like this. The heat, oops, I just messed it up. I hate working with the negative signs, but it's probably easier to do that. The Q in the heat exchanger is going to be H1 uh, minus H4. So it'll be negative. It'll be a negative heat transfer into the heat exchanger. And then the work out of the compressor will be um, H1 uh, minus H2. Okay, we just repeated that, what we had before. But we want to make a, a table of the information. So uh, let's go ahead and work on this table for state. Uh, one, two, three, four pressure, temperature, enthalpy, entropy. So the pressure is 90, the temperature is 300. <clears throat> um, let's do this. If we're, you read the problem through the whole way, you see that the pressure ratio is 9. I can, I can compute the pressure at 2, the pressure at 3, and the pressure at 4 right away. Let's go ahead and do that. What is the pressure at state 2 if the pressure ratio is 9? 9 times 9, right? 9 times 9, back down to 90. Okay. The maximum temperature in the cycle is 1,600 Kelvin. We know that's what comes out of that burner or combustor. So that's state 3, isn't it? 1,600 Kelvin. On the basis of a cold air standard analysis using this value for specific heat constant volume, C sub P, determine the blank, blank, blank. Now, right away, as soon as they say cold air, not only am I going to be thinking of these changes in enthalpy, but they simplify to C sub P, T3 minus T2, don't they? And this simplifies to C sub P, T3 minus T4. This simplifies to C sub P, T1 minus T4. And this simplifies to C sub P, T1 minus T2. So I really don't need to get the enthalpies if I have a cold air standard analysis. I need the temperatures. I need the temperature changes. Okay. So, so uh, <clears throat> conceptually, it, the temperatures and the enthalpies are not only related, they're, they're the, the H is only, for, remember for an air, H is only a function of temperature. So if it doesn't say cold air standard? Then you would go to the air tables. Yep. But what we're going to do here is <clears throat> you, don't, you don't even need this S when it says cold air standard. It's just pressures and temperatures. True? Okay. So now, <clears throat> how in the world can I calculate the temperature at state 2? Well, we conceptually remember it's isentropic compression. Isentropic compression of an ideal gas. Assuming constant specific heats, we can use one of three relations. I'll just write them all out. T2 divided by T1 is equal to P2 divided by P1 raised to the power K minus 1 over K. Or we can use the relation T2 over T1 equal to V1 over V2 all raised to the power K minus 1. Or we can use that P2 over P1 is equal to V1 over V2 all to the power K. We derived those. They're not trivial to derive. 
Students love them once they get used to them. They'll apply them to steam in the two-phase region, subcooled liquid region, whatever. It's not to be applied anywhere and everywhere. It's for isentropic processes, ideal gas, constant specific heat. Of That's it. That's all. But they're very handy. So which version of these equations, version A, B, or C, would you suggest we use to calculate T2? T2. A is the one. Why? Because we're given the pressure ratio coming off of the auto and the diesel cycle where we were specified the compression ratio. We fell in love with version B or equation B, right? But this is now the Brayton cycle, so it's the pressure ratio. And so right away you can calculate the temperature at state 2 based only on the pressures. So this temperature at 2 is equal to the initial temperature times the pressure ratio. This problem, it's 9 to the K. That's 1.4 minus 1, so 0.4 divided by 1.4. Do a couple of these calculations, and it becomes pretty straightforward. So if we go ahead and calculate that, <coughs> what we'll find <coughs> excuse me, is that the temperature comes in at uh, 561.9 Kelvin. Anybody have a calculator? I got 562. 562 is good. All right. <clears throat> you want to make sure and be able to run those calcs, okay? How about from the temperature at 4? How do I calculate the temperature at 4? Same equation A. So this time the temperature at 4 is equal to the temperature at 3. This is going to be the pressure at 4 divided by the pressure at 3 all to the K minus 1 over K. And that pressure 4 over pressure 3 is going to be not 9. It's going to be 1 over 9. It, it, it's the, it went up by the pressure ratio of 9. It goes down by a pressure ratio of 1 over 9. Okay? And so you calculate the temperature at state 4, 854.3 Kelvin. Make sense? Once I have those, I can go and I calculate, and I would encourage you to go and calculate each one of the Q's and W's. I would do this. I would check that QB, which is positive, plus QHX, which is negative, will be Q net. That's a net amount of heat per unit mass brought into the cycle. I would also check that WT, which is positive, plus WC, which is negative, is W net. And if they are not equal, they must be equal. Sometimes students say, I don't know how to, I don't know if my answer is right or not. That's a great skill in engineering to develop the ability to know when your answer is right or to check your own errors. True? Did I tell you about the student that graduated 10 years ago or so? They finally got canned because he cost the company about $2 million. And I know I'm not sharing his name or anything, but this is true. This happens. You don't want to get canned when you're 50 years old because you make mistakes. It's really hard or 30 or 40 years old because you make mistakes. And the reason he made, didn't, did not tell you this story is he didn't, he was too proud to have anybody check his work and he didn't check his own work. And when you're doing the design of buildings, and that's the business he was in, and they build it the way you told them to build it, and now they got to go back and retrofit, you know how expensive it is to fix one of those in construction? because the owner doesn't want to take occupy their brand new building they spent all this money on, and they start pointing fingers because somebody's got to pay for the fix. And so if it traced back to the engineer, and that's what happened to this guy, at least that's what the, the other coworker shared with me, <laughs> and uh, they said uh, we had to let him go. It just cost us too much money. So learn how to check your work. This is a great way to check your work right here. They must equal each other. If not, look for an error. Yes? So the K that you use 
that okay from the previous plot with Nazi Is that a common? You know what? Look at these ratios. How would I get K? K was not given in this problem statement. But is there enough information given in this problem to get K? It's defined as C sub P over C sub V, and you're both given C sub P and C sub V. And it'll work out to 1.4, yeah. That's a good question, thank you. Well, all questions are good. Um, okay, so then you could calculate the thermal efficiency. That's the work net divided by Q in the boiler, not the boiler, the burner. And then the back work ratio, which is, I just did, wrote the equations before, um, the Q, not the Q, negative WC divided by WT. Okay, what you're going to find, the back work ratio is high. And I left my sheet of paper with this problem upstairs, but I have a continuation of this problem with numbers. So, this problem is continued, and what did I put in bold? A new sentence. The compressor isentropic efficiencies 83%, and the turbine isentropic efficiencies 91%. That's the only thing that's been changed. So what we do is we have the same four components that we sketch, the same location of the states as we're going through, but probably it's a little easier to see it on a temperature entropy diagram. Remember, this is a line of constant pressure for P high. This is a line of constant pressure for P low. We started our state one at P low. We went through the compressor to get to state two. But the, what we had for the ideal, the word ideal is no longer here in front of the Brayton. It meant that the compressor isotropic efficiency is 100%. But now we would say this is state 2S. And where is state 2 actual? <coughs> to the left, to the right, above it, below it? Where is it in relation to state 2S? Yeah, I asked this question. Remember this a couple of days ago? Yeah. It's still at the high pressure. That's our basic assumption. The compressor pressure ratio has not changed. So the pressure ratio is still 9. So you're on that black line at the high pressure. So you're not above it or below it, but you have to the right or to the left on that line. And so, which way is it? Okay. This is to the right, and this is to the left. True? Because I'm, I'm we're getting some answers which are going back and forth on me. So, where is the state 2 actual? Okay. You're dyslexic and you're confusing the right answer with the wrong. Say the other side. To the right. He's got it. He's got it. It's to the right. So, and how would you know? Somebody sitting there quietly saying that two actual is over there. Why is it over there? Somebody's got it right in their mind. I want them to explain it to me. Because the temperature out is going to be higher because you have to dump more work in because it's not as efficient. That's one way, a good way of explaining it. There's another way. Somebody else has got a different way of explaining it. Look at the entropy. Look at the S. If you have entropy generation, guess what has to go out? S2 has to be greater than S1 because of irreversibilities. So you can look at S to tell you that, or you can look at T to tell you that. But that's where state 2 is. Now we come up to the same maximum temperature for state 3. And we pass it through, no, oh, I forgot. Should I draw that as a solid line or should I draw it as a dashed line? And what's the difference? One, you cannot interpret the area under that on a TS diagram as Q. That's the dashed line. You can't. You can interpret Q as the area under the line on a TS diagram if it's reversible. All right, so now what about uh, three down the four? This is where four was, right? But we are call that 4S. And now we want to know where is four actual? To the right, 
or to the left on the low pressure line. I'm going to pause and walk around. Let's answer the question at hand. Who would like to be the volunteer? Is it to the right or to the left? Thank you very much. It's to the right. You can tell by two things. Look at the temperature, look at the entropy. So it's going to come out over here for, do a dashed line. The turbine, if it has, it's trying to get as much work out as possible. If it has some irreversibilities, it's not able to get as much work out as possible. So exit temperature is too high. It's taken away, higher enthalpy. Or you look at the entropy, the entropy says, hey, uh, if there was some entropy generation, hence it has to go out at a higher S. So there you go. That's the modified cycle. So what do we do in our property table for the state? Okay, We still have one, two. I'm going to put in two S and two actual, then three then 4S and 4 actual. I'm going to introduce two new states, this state and that state. And we're interested in the pressure and the temperature. We talked about it already. We're going to do cold air analysis. So those are the two. I know H and S if you're doing the tables with variable specific heat. So did the pressures change? No, the pressure table you can fig fi fill out pretty quickly. 90, 810. 810. And I think this is what bothers some students. They're saying, if it's not as efficient, how can it do as good a job of boosting the pressure? And the problem is, is that's the way we have to analyze it. It's an easier problem if we assume it's still able to achieve that same pressure ratio, when intuitively you're probably saying, I don't think it's still going to achieve the same pressure ratio. Well, we're going to basically say it has to achieve the same pressure ratio, and we're going to have to supply more work in. That's, that's the logic. I hate to say it. but um, I remember when I took this class years ago, it's like, well, wh why doesn't that go down? Why doesn't that go down in the 700s or you know, lower? Because we have to assume it to analyze it. All right, this is still 810. Then you go down to 90 and 90. The temperature here, it's still, uh, what was it? Uh, what is that temperature? 300. And we still go to 561.9 Kelvin isentropically. The same equation applies. But how do I get this temperature to actual, which is going to be greater? Look at, I, if I'm coming in with a number less than 562, I have a problem. Look for my error. That temperature is going to be greater than 562. How are we going to get it? Well, we're going to use this 83% isentropic efficiency. What was the isentropic efficiency of the compressor? It's defined as the work compressor actual divided by the work compressor isentropic. The work compressor isentropic, what is that? It'll be the H. I know we're going to do this as, as coming out, W compressor. This is state 2. This is state 1. So it's going to be H1 minus H2, 2S. This is going to be H1 minus 2 actual. If you use constant specific heats, C sub P times T1 minus T2S divided by C sub P, T1 minus T2 actual. The C sub P's cancel. And we're left with, after a little algebra, that T2 actual is equal to T1 plus uh, 1 over the uh, efficiency, isentropic efficiency of the compressor times uh, T, did I just switch the sign on that? Um, T2S minus T1. There, that works. I think I, I wanted to get rid of that minus sign.
Does that look good? Okay, you make the computation using that equation. Somebody make that computation. Please verify that it's 615.5. What's the efficiency? 83%. Can you do that? Did anybody make it? You got it? We're done. All right. Then it still comes out at the piping hot 1600. It isentropically expands the number we had 854 before. And then we also have uh, 921. Same type of calculation using the efficiency of the turbine. Okay. So what we can do is these numbers I do have that uh, the peak temperature is, uh, whoops, the temperature at the compressor outlet is uh, 615. The peak pressure, that was easy, 810. The temperature at the turbine outlet, that's just repeating what's, uh, no, that's uh, the 921. The heat addition in the burner, well, now it comes in at 615 and goes out at 1600. So the heat addition in the burner is the C sub P times T3 minus T2 actual. And the heat addition in the burner is around 989 kilojoules per kilogram. The net work comes in at 365. The thermal efficiency is 36.9%. And the back work ratio I didn't calculate it. I asked to calculate it, but you can make the calculation here. The back work ratio is going to be the work of the uh, compressor. That's uh, 317.1 divided by 682.0. Somebody want to run that? Forty six point five percent. And that's why these engines are hard. <laughs> uh, once they're working, they're beautiful machines, pieces of machine. But uh, you have some you're not able to do a good job of analyzing, designing or, or constructing a turbine or compressor. You can't get it to work. OK. <clears throat> this is it shown uh, true to scale. So actually, for those numbers showing you uh, on a TS diagram, temperature entropy diagram, with the numbers that I just repeat, repeated. OK? Well, there's a lot of applications for the Brayton cycle. I just put it in the context of electric generation. Aircraft propulsion, I talked about. There, you don't want to generate a lot of shaft power. You want to generate a lot of thrust, so you have a nozzle, extra component on the back end. Marine propulsion. What do you mean by marine propulsion? A lot of the Navy ships are gas turbines. They're not piston cylinder. Uh, what about helicopters? Yep, a lot of helicopters are gas turbine driven. They are not piston cylinder anymore. What about the Abrams tank? It doesn't have a nozzle on the back. It's gas turbine with a shaft for the drivetrain. They are gas turbine. They, that was switched, what, 20 years ago? Maybe 25 years now? So gas turbines are light, and they have a lot of power for their weight. So they have a great um, power to weight ratio advantage over other power plants. That's why they're great for helicopters and tanks and boats and other things. Okay? Um, this is supposed to be all covered in Thermo 2. And I love it when I cover it, but we're out of time for this section in our class. So I'm going to stop right now.